In this film, Yvette Roundtree MRCVS, honorary assistant professor in exotic medicine at the University of Nottingham, demonstrates how to castrate a guinea pig using a modified abdominal technique. So this is Chip. He is a seven month old guinea pig that we have in for castration today. And we're going with a slightly modified abdominal technique. Um, so obviously he's been clipped in a routine um, manner. I'll explain as we go along why we're going with the abdominal technique. Now these little sticky drapes, we really like using. Um, I know lots of people use lots of different types of drapes. The nice thing with these, and these are actually individual tattoo dressings that we buy on Amazon, and they're much, much cheaper than the ones that we get from our veterinary wholesalers. Um, we can still sterilize them in the autoclave, and they work really, really well. We actually use them for a lot of things, not even just our small furries. Um, but it just gives us a nice um, surgical field. And then our landmarks for the surgery, that's a big drape. Our landmarks for the surgery, well, our main one is actually the umbilicus. Uh, obviously, we have umbilicus here. We have the penis sitting here. We're going to be make our incision midline just behind that umbilicus. So Chip has... Oh, have a blade, please. Chip has been anaesthetised with metatomidine ketamine methadone um, IM. And then he's had meropitin and meloxicam subcut and some fluids. Thank you. Um, we do use... I, I use methadone for most of my small furries. Uh, for their surgeries, actually for all of my small fairies for their surgeries. Um, I find it works really, really well and I really do think with these hung up fermenters that yes, there may be a slightly increased risk of gut stasis in, um, with using the more potent opioids, but it's by far negated by the superior pain relief. And yeah, I am using um, Meloxicam by injection. I don't actually personally use the licensed product most of the time for guinea pigs because I do use a different dose and do use the dose that's um, the dose from the formulary. So we're doing our midline incision. Apologies to Alistair Hodgson Moore for not using a blade holder, but there isn't one in this kit. And we're doing our midline incision, identifying that linear alba. And then going through it. And I find with guinea pigs, if you go too far back, the linear alba is much, much harder to, we're bleeding a little bit, the linear is much harder to identify and much thicker and diff more difficult to get through. But it's caught a little bit of fat there. So, very easy. We're aiming our forceps laterally. We're getting that big fat pad. We're giving it a gentle tug. I know when I first started doing these, we always used to think, oh no, you don't want to go in the abdomen unless you can help it. On a hind gut fermenter, because we'd always be worried about touching the gut and causing gut stasis, well, I don't even usually see the gut on these cases. So there's a testicle. And we want to identify the epididymis, which is there. And then we've actually got tunic there, um, inverted as well. Could I have some three knot and vicolor securus orb, please? Yeah. And I always use, so that little bit of bleeding that we had at the start is actually just because that gonad fat pad was sitting just behind the umbilicus. Thank you. So I think it was volunteering to come out. Now, if you've seen the videos that we've done in the past about um, with um, other rodent neuters, and equally, I know this is how I, used to, how I used to do it for my guinea pigs as well. I did used to just do, hello, what are you? Hello. Well, that's not normal. 
He's got a little abscess there. <laughs> Always worth checking you've got everything out properly. That's an interesting one. So you can actually see there he's got a little abscess. That is not normal tissue. Should not be bright yellowy green. Um, he's got a little abscess in his spermatic cord. That's interesting. Well, it'll be out in a sec. Um, so how I used to do these, we always used to do, um, and with my, my smaller rodents, I usually just do, um, I just do the castrate and then and close. I don't do anything about the tunic. However, with my guinea pigs and chinchillas, because they are that wee bit bigger, we've added an additional technique, uh, an additional step. So on this occasion, I'm not going to be, I'm not placing a clamp because everything's quite friable on him. So I'm, I'm ligating kind of freehand and then I'll clamp because obviously I don't want pus coming back through. Do you find with this technique we get a lot fewer post-op complications than we used to with the scrotal technique? Guinea pigs do have a lovely habit of dragging their scrotum on the floor. And that does increase, the, and obviously they urinate in, the, in that area as well. So you do get a lot of post-op with the, with the old pre-scrotal, oh, sorry, the scrotal approach. We used to get quite a lot of abscesses. Actually this way it's it, there's minimal issues post-op usually. So we're going to release that. Now we're back to that tunic. What I like to do with these is actually so to minimise the chances of having any herniation of abdominal contents through into the scrotum, I just invert that tunic, which happens naturally anyway as you're doing it and then do a transfixing ligature through it. So we, we are kind of ablating the tunic, which is quite muscular in a guinea pig. Um, we're ablating that, but inverting it at the same time. And it just means we've got a closed inguinal canal um, and less likely to herniate now. I've only, I have used to do, a, I've done a lot of these over the last few years. That's a technique I've been using for about seven years. And I've only actually had two that have herniated. So it's pretty, it's pretty low risk. But with my bigger boys, particularly when they are already um, sexually mature, I do think this is a, a, a worthwhile adaptation. So um, we're, using, we're using a three naught braided um, absorbable. And then we'll just cut that off. There we go. And that can go back in as well. So for knowing where, uh, have we got the right bit of tissue? It's difficult until you've done it. Basically, we're going, and the fat pad is just usually just sitting there, but it's a, it's a different consistency of fat. It's a bit silkier, it's a bit kind of. This cat. Um, it's just a lot, it's just a different texture. So that's a more normal, no point showing you the normal on the other one, because obviously it wasn't. So we've got the fat pad comes down and the, and the blood vessels are in it. And then, so the, the cord is our vas deferens, which is here, and our, and our um, blood vessels as well. 
So we can just clamp those off and then we can ligate them as standard. From a medications point of view for this young man, obviously metatomidine, ketamine, methadone is the protocol I use. I quite like it. And then we're isoflurane. We do have actually a really nice pulse ox trace on this young man. He's actually got the pulse ox on the one of his feet that is pink rather than being pigmented. And it's coming up really, really nicely. We have put the capnograph on. We're getting a little bit of a trace, but it, as, because we're on a mask, it's never going to be an amazing trace. But we can see his breathing on there reasonably well. He is tilted as well with, uh, with his chest up obviously to assist with his breathing so that we're not um, we haven't got gut contents putting pressure on his diaphragm. Now, from a prokinetics point of view if you like I always give these guys um, meropotent partly from a prokinetic point of view. The other one is as a visceral pain relief because obviously we we may be touching the gut, although, as I say, I've, I can just about see the bladder there, but we, we're, not ex we're not really touching anything in this area, if we can help it. Um, tried lots of things, since, um, various options since ranitidine went off the market, um, and I find meropotent works really nicely for most of these guys. Potentially, we don't need a prokinetic. I know not everyone uses one. Um, but I just find this is a nice combo and it does seem to improve the depth of anaesthesia or well, the stability of the anaesthesia so I think it does give us some pain relief as well when we're in the abdomen. So again we're just going to transfix this. Now I'm not going to go looking for it because it's something I don't really want to touch but when you are doing these surgeries sometimes you will see a rather strange structure don't see it very often um, in most of our species of rodents. The two species probably I've seen it the most commonly in is the guinea pig and not a rodent, um, but hedgehogs. But they do have um, quite large seminiferous vesicles, which are huge and they can, they look like gut, but they're not. They're thin, very thin walled. They're less vascular than gut would be. And if you happen to cut into them, they're full of jelly. And it is one of the, part of the components of semen. Now those will go down in size. They're in, the, they're in this kind of location as well. They do go down in size once they've been neutered. I have seen them abscessed a couple of times, uh, once in a guinea pig and once in a, um, a duprasy. So it is something to be aware of. It's, it is sitting there, but I'm not gonna get them out because Something that thin walled does not need poking. And now we've just got a routine closure. We're going to close our muscle layer first, of course. So, like I said before, I would use this. Te I would use the modification. Um, with a, a sexually mature guinea pig um, or a, chin, a sexually mature chinchilla. Probably, I've no, the, the two that I have seen herniation both were adult guinea pig, uh, adult animals when we did them. If they were only 12 weeks old, which is where I would be quite happy to do boy guinea pigs, I probably wouldn't do the extra um, just because it's slightly bit more pulling around, slightly more trauma risk. Um, obviously we want to minimize our handling now post-operatively for this young man I always want my guinea pigs to be for obvious reasons eating as soon as possible so he's going to have I am at Pamazol immediately once we've got him off the table we'll keep him on oxygen until he's fully awake he is of course on isoflurane as well today I'm just going to cut my drape so I don't get it caught up And then once he's fully awake, he'll be having, um, he'll be assist fed, um, make sure that he is eating before he goes home. He was pooing even while he was 
while we were prepping him for surgery, so uh, his guts seem pretty happy at the moment. If I have a guinea pig, or any rodent, or a, or a rabbit for that matter, that is usually pair bonded or in a group, I would always have them in with their companions. It does massively seem to decrease the amount of stress, um, which improves anaesthetic quality. Um, and obviously stress is something we want to avoid as well. It does also help with pain relief. We know that um, distraction analgesia is very much a thing and particularly in a prey animal where they're already a bit anxious, that can be really handy, just having someone else with them. Um, and someone else to snuggle up with. This young man though is, is, has come in from a rescue and he's being neutered so that he can go and join a group of girls. So he's on his own, so, but he's been in our exotics ward where we've got pet remedy in there. It's nice and quiet, I've got no barking dogs, um, things like that. And then, oh, that was my colleague just coming back in. And I always send these guys home with Meloxicam as well. And so it's not the licensed product because of the dose that I use. Um, but doses are published. So. And I usually go once or twice a day, usually twice a day for the first couple of days and then drop them down to once a day, depending on how they're doing. I know sometimes I've seen things recently online actually where people are asking about rabbits and guinea pigs and rats and using buster collars which I can't say I've ever had a need to um, I think they're massively stressful and actually if you've got gentle tissue handling and good pain relief they shouldn't interfere with their wounds so we've got our intradermal there and then can I have some tissue glue please mm -hmm. Don't mind, the, uh, the multi-parameter gets a bit cross if it doesn't think we're using it to its full capabilities. Like most, like most pieces of kit, it likes to shout. <laughs> but guinea pig is actually fine. And although the pulse ox probably isn't that happy about the, um, the traces, I'm actually really happy with them. Some tissue glue. Actually, oh, wait, I'll just take our drape off. You can see our incision. You can see it's a pretty small incision, actually. Just a little bit of bonus anatomy. I promise I have not got any glue on my fingers because that is a bit of a disaster if you try checking that at this point. A little bit of anatomy that I never learned when I was a student. If you do exteriorise the penis of the guinea pig and if you are checking them for urinary problems, you do need to check them there. But at the end, there are two little spines, which are a bit weird. Um, there is an os penis, which is here, and the urethral orifice is actually there. So it is not, if you ever need to catheterise one, it is not where the spikes are, it's further down. But tip to the wise, do not try doing that when you've got tissue glue on your hands. And obviously these guys quite often do get quite a lot of crud in there, that's a technical term, see we're still pooing, um, in the um, perineal sac. And that usually improves significantly once they've been neutered.